Hi, this is Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds. On Saturday, March 26th, I was in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, where I gave a keynote speech on the 38th anniversary of the nuclear disaster at Three Mile Island. This is that speech. In it, I discovered new scientifically provable data that clearly shows that the people in Harrisburg received much higher radiation than the Nuclear Regulatory Commission ever told them. Thank you for your support of Fairwinds. We can't do this kind of work without you. When the Three Mile Island disaster was unfolding 38 years ago, I worked in the nuclear power industry, and I was on the opposite side of the TMI argument. You were right. I was wrong. For the next half hour, I'd like to talk to you about my journey from a senior vice president in the atomic power industry and a member of what is often called the nuclear priesthood to someone who today knows that the data clearly indicates that America's flirtation with nuclear power never, ever made any sense, financially, environmentally, and from a human perspective. Again and again, people have asked me, how could I believe in something so toxic? While growing up, I was taught that the Adams for Peace program, kicked off by President Dwight Eisenhower in 1953, when I was four years old, would take the evil of atomic war and use the power of the atom for peaceful purposes. And then there was the math. As a geek, the math involved in analyzing atomic power and creating atomic power plants was elegant, intoxicating, and magical. As a post-World War II baby boomer raised in the 50s, I was expected to put the war behind me do my best in school, go to college in order to assure a good job. And with my love of math and the peaceful pursuit of atomic power, what wonderful contributions I could make. Indoctrination into the nuclear priesthood starts early, certainly in college. We were trained to believe that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was smarter than we were. And they were tough regulators whose job was to protect the public from the risks of atomic power. High-powered, high-paying employment soon followed. As Upton Sinclair said, it's difficult to get a man to understand something when his job depends on not understanding it. At the time of the Three Mile Island disaster, I was married to my wife, Maggie. We were living just north of the Pennsylvania border in Binghamton, New York, and Maggie was pregnant with our first child. I was a member of the Speakers Club. And as events unfolded at TMI, I appeared on radio and TV explaining that all the safety systems worked at TMI and that any radioactivity was contained. The NRC said radiation releases were very low, and I believed them. Nuclear industry insiders blamed incompetent reactor operators and never considered fundamental design flaws. The TMI reactor design is the only reactor type built that was capable of creating something called superheated steam. Coal utilities that were considering converting to atomic power loved superheat. And so the fundamentally flawed superheated steam in the TMI design was part of a marketing gimmick designed by Babcock and Wilcox. All the other reactor designers chose a more robust, safer approach that created something called wet steam. The TMI design was elegant, but it was not robust. Then came Chernobyl. Again, the nuclear priesthood blamed the reactor operators. And of course, the United States nuclear engineers and the U.S. government blamed the Russians. And people around the world believed the Russian myth that with the exception of the firemen, nobody died at Chernobyl either. Just like the U.S. government claimed, and continues to claim, that no one died due to TMI. And Japan's Fukushima disaster followed only 20 years later. Designed by Americans in New York City and built by Americans in California, the Fukushima Daiichi design was a disaster waiting to happen. With the ongoing tragedy at Fukushima, there's not one corporation, one government, or one group of people like the oft-times wrongly maligned operators, to point the blame at 
for the three Fukushima Daiichi meltdowns. And of course, within three days and well before any data was in, the nuclear power industry and the NRC said releases were extremely low and nobody would die. Back in 1990, between Chernobyl and Fukushima, I left the nuclear industry. More accurately, the nuclear industry left me. To make a long story short, as a senior VP, I found safety violations at the nuclear company I worked for, which was licensed by the NRC. I informed the president of the company about the safety violations so that they could be corrected and procedures would be followed. And instead, I was fired. I honestly believed that the NRC would regulate for safety first. So after my firing, I applied to the NRC expecting to be protected as a nuclear whistleblower. Boy, was I wrong. The NRC joined my former employer in decimating my career. During congressional hearings organized and chaired by Senator John Glenn, I finally felt heard and exonerated from the cover-up perpetuated by the nuclear industry and its alleged regulators at the NRC. After the hearing, a famous nuclear lawyer, who had been a colleague and who I thought was my friend, took me aside and said, Arnie, in this business, you're either for us or against us, and you just crossed the line. Bankruptcy and foreclosure of our home followed shortly thereafter. I first realized how wrong I was about TMI in the midst of this federal whistleblowing issue. Then, Norma Mont contacted me and asked me to be a TMI expert witness for the plaintiffs regarding the meltdown at TMI. I told them no one was heard at Three Mile Island and that hardly any radiation was released. Figuring that this was just one of those nonsensical and overblown class action lawsuits. Norm was firm, he knew his facts, and he convinced me to at least have a look at the case. That look opened my eyes, not just about TMI, but it was my first real view into the lack of honesty, integrity, and regulatory cover-ups of the nuclear power industry. Since that time, I've learned a lot about specific technical issues at atomic reactors, but for tonight, I've tried to distill them down into three distinct areas. First, you have to believe these three things if nuclear power is to continue in the United States. All three are wrong, but nuclear lobbyists are working hard to get you believe that they are factual. Myth one, nuclear power is safe. If I had a deck of cards and I asked you, what are the odds of drawing an ace of clubs? you'd say there's one ace of clubs in a deck of 52 cards, so the odds are one in 52. The nuclear industry would have you believe that the odds of a meltdown are about one in a million. That means that the NRC knows there's only a million things that can go terribly wrong, and only one will lead to a serious release of radiation. They forgot about Fukushima Daiichi. That card wasn't in the deck. Look at these numbers. History shows us that we've had five meltdowns in 38 years, or about one every seven years. But if you buy into the nuclear power myth, you have to believe the history of fake news or alternative facts. As I've been saying for the last 25 years, and yes, it's mathematical, history shows us that sooner or later, in any foolproof system, the fools are going to exceed the proofs. Moving on to the second myth that no one was heard at Three Mile Island, let's look at the atomic power industry around the globe and how it's treated those scientists who disagreed with this party line. Here's a quick sampling of reports that show that people really did die from these nuclear meltdowns. Alexei Yablokov, he recently passed away, the scientific data corroborated and translated by a U.S. medical doctor shows that at least a million people will die at Chernobyl. The U.S. book editor was fired after it was published in English. Dr. Yuri Bandashevsky. He was thrown in jail when he began to speak about his research into Chernobyl Heart. 
He's now living in the Ukraine after being exiled from Belarus. Dr. Chris Busby has been belittled internationally and his valid scientific data has been ignored. And lastly for tonight, Dr. Steve Wing, who passed away last year. He was ignored, and the atomic power industry worked to make sure his grant funding dried up. Let's focus on Dr. Steve Wing's expert epidemiological reports regarding TMI. Steve and I first met back in 2009 when each of us was an invited speaker at the Pennsylvania State House in Harrisburg for the 30th commemoration of the meltdown at the TMI power reactor. Steve's map on the side shows red areas up and down the Susquehanna River. That's the blue diagonal line through the slide. And in those red areas, cancer rates are much higher than normal. I spoke first discussing how the Nuclear Regulatory Commission had deliberately underestimated the amount of radiation released during the TMI disaster. Steve followed with a presentation that showed that cancer rates in the vicinity of Harrisburg increased significantly after the meltdown and release of radioactivity. You can see both Steve's and my presentation in Harrisburg on the 30th anniversary on the Fairwinds website on the TMI page. Steve and I had never met before that day in Harrisburg, and neither of us knew of each other's ongoing research, TMI testimony, or what the other was presenting until the 30th commemoration of TMI. Personally, before seeing Steve's data that day, I couldn't understand why more people had not gotten cancer as a result of the radioactive releases my analysis uncovered and that the NRC had attempted to cover up. Steve could not understand how the cancer rates could have risen so much when he reviewed the NRC's grossly underestimated calculations. When we finished presenting on that March day, we both understood the logical consequences of each other's experts' reports and the evidentiary testimony, and the full magnitude of the TMI meltdown became apparent to each of us. In that eureka moment, we became fellow truthsayers, respected colleagues, and fast friends. Let's look at the details of Steve's map in comparison to the NRC data. If you go to the official NRC TMI website, the NRC says that about 10 million curies of radiation were released. An NRC manager named Lake Barrett concocted this number from thin air within two weeks of the beginning of the disaster. You may not know it, but there was no way to measure this radiation release because all the on-site radiation detectors had failed. While the NRC's website states 10 million curies, the NRC's own data from environmental monitoring shows a minimum of 36 million curies. Lake Barrett has now been hired by Tokyo Electric to minimize the radiation releases from Fukushima disaster, just like he did at TMI. Because the radiation releases could not actually be monitored, the NRC was forced to back calculate the radiation releases based on the radiation readings from only nine radiation monitors that were placed at off-site locations. Let's look at where the NRC radiation detectors were placed compared to where Steve Wing found the highest incidence of cancer. On day one, when the disaster began, take a look at how few radiation detectors there were off-site, nine, and how they were nowhere near where Dr. Wing proved the cancer rates were the highest. Ditto the second day, not many radiation detectors, and not where Dr. Wing showed the cancer incidence was high. Same thing for the third day. Only a few environmental detectors, and not where they should be. No improvement on the fourth day either. That's right. Radiation monitors were never placed near the locations where the cancers ended up being the highest. This is my favorite comic in the whole world. It's a Dilbert comic. Dilbert turns to his boss and he says, I can do this feasibility analysis in two minutes. 
Then he says, it's the worst idea in the world. Numbers don't lie. And his boss says, but our CEO loves the idea. And Dilbert's reply is, luckily, assumptions do lie. The nuclear industry picks its facts and its authors who write the reports to confirm the myth that no one was hurt. Remember, in this industry, you're either for us or against us. I'd like to close out myth two with a quote from someone who was at Middletown High School on the day the disaster began. This is an email she sent me. Our chemistry teacher had taught the whole semester on nuclear power and waste storage, so he had run a Geiger counter outside the window for the entire semester. On the morning of the accident, my chem class started at around 10 a.m. As we entered the classroom, the Geiger counter went haywire from the normal clicking to a solid buzz. He immediately picked up the phone and called Governor Thornburg's office and reported the readings. The response was, we know, don't do anything about it. By 11 a.m., parents were coming to school and pulling out their children. Of course, many of the people in town worked at the plant or had relatives who did, and they did not wait for a formal evacuation call. The third myth is that nuclear power is inexpensive. But we have to remember, Wall Street refuses to finance new nuclear power plants. Former NRC Commissioner Peter Bradford, he was on the commission during the Three Mile accident, said, trying to solve global warming by building nuclear power plants is like trying to solve global hunger by serving the world caviar. In Florida, four nuclear plants were supposed to have been built. They would have increased the total power available in Florida by about 8%, but they would have doubled the capital cost of all of the generation in Florida. And of course, data from economists Dr. Mark Cooper and green energy futurist Amory Lovins proves that nuclear power crowds out less expensive carbon reduction solutions. From 1947 until 2015, the federal government has pumped almost a trillion dollars into energy subsidies. 86% of those subsidies have gone to King Kong. That's coal, oil, nuclear, and gas. Renewables totaled only 14% of all the federal subsidies, and most of that went into corn ethanol, not solar or wind. We have an important choice to make. Do we want to continue the 20th century model of large centrally located power plants, or do we want to move to a 21st century model that uses many small distributed generation sources linked together to serve our energy needs? Does Mother Nature make a tree with a few large leaves or many small leaves? I think that 100 years from now, the economic issue we're talking about today won't be portrayed as pro-nukes versus anti-nukes, but rather as a real debate about distributed renewable generation. In conclusion, since I graduated college, my mind has changed. I think the evidence clearly shows that the risks of building nuclear power plants and continuing to operate the old rundown ones outweigh any benefits. It's time to end the nuclear era before it ends humanity. And it's long past time to close Three Mile Island. Thank you.